Excellent. All right. Well, welcome everyone and good morning. My name is Laree Williamson. I am the CEO of Agriculture for Life. And what that means is I have the greatest job of working with teachers and students all across the province of Alberta, teaching and delivering agriculture education. So together, we learn where our food comes from. Today, we're celebrating as part of a large program happening all across Canada called Canadian Agriculture Literacy Month. That's a huge mouthful. But what it means is students all across Canada are celebrating this month and learning about agriculture and where their food comes from. So we're super excited to have you here today. And we're very, very excited to introduce Farmer Wayne and Tara, who are going to teach us all about Alberta canola and what is canola. So over to you. Thank you, Laurie. So it's lovely to be with you all. And good morning, everyone. So we'll get going with our presentation. So we are Alberta canola producers. And next, we'll, so and part of our mission is we teach for tomorrow with Learn Canola. So I'll, to give you a little bit of an overview of today before we really get rolling for things. So we're going to talk, Wayne is going to be sharing his canola story. And I'm going to do a little bit of talk about what canola is and that kind of thing and share a little bit of information with you. And then we'll be pay, playing a little bit of a sort of game at the end and expanding your canola with canola fun facts at the towards the end. So just so that you we get going here. So I've been with Alberta Canola as their agriculture and education coordinator for just over two years. And before this, I used to teach with Edmonton public uh, schools here in Edmonton and surrounding communities. I come from a small family farm of about 140 years. And up in the right hand corner, this is around just close to harvest a couple of years ago from our family farm. And I would be about uh, the fourth generation on our family farm. Uh, and as well, I, with Alberta Canola. And so we are a, uh, a farmer paid commission. And what uh, more specifically, we've also been around since about 1989. And we were the province's first refundable checkoff producer organization. Our mission is to support the long term success of canola farmers in Alberta through research, extension, consumer engagement, and advocacy. So my role with Alberta Canola is a little bit more specific as we, as part of my role, and Wayne was with me on PEP as well, which is the Public Engagement and Promotion Committee, but we help to educate students and the general public, including teachers and students, about how canola is safely and sustainably produced, the health benefits of canola, and the large and larger issue of where consumers are getting their food from. We also help farmers find their public voice as they operate under increased public scrutiny um, and the future in regards to social license. We also help to sell more uh, canola products by increasing our demand and in canola internationally and specifically in Eastern and Central Canada. So to kick things off before I turn it over to Wayne, I have a little bit of an introduction video to what canola is for you all that I will play next. Canola, a Canadian invention, is an oil seed crop with yellow flowers. That's too close, back it up. Good enough. That is used to produce canola oil and canola meal. The growing season is approximately 100 days. Farmers purchase pre-treated canola seeds to prevent harm from insects or diseases. The farmers will test the soil in early spring to check the moisture level, nutrients, and temperature of the soil before seeding. Canola is typically seeded and fertilized in May. Farmers work with agronomists to determine the right amount of fertilizer needed. Most farmers use a seeder to plant canola directly into last year's stubble to reduce soil erosion and conserve water and organic matter. Farmers practice crop rotation by changing the types of crops they grow yearly in a field to help prevent disease, manage weeds, 
insects, and pests. The use of precision technology, like GPS and variable rate applications, assists farmers with everything from fertilizer to crop protection products. These are the various growth stages of canola. Canola and other crops depend on beneficial insects, like bees and other pollinators for growth. A canola plant produces approximately 60 to 100 pods per plant, with each pod containing 20 to 30 seeds. Brown seeds in golden yellow pods indicate the canola is ready for harvest in the fall. To expand your knowledge, check us out on learncanola.com. All right, so hopefully that helped you understand a little bit more about canola and we'll carry on. And of course, if you guys have any questions, please put them into the chat box and we'll do our best to answer as we go along or towards the end. And Wayne, would you like to talk a little bit more to the next slide? Sure. Good morning, students and teachers. Uh, so that's the first thing on there is uh, the Heart Smart cooking oil. Um, many of you probably have cooking oil right in your kitchen, and I even brought some along with me today. So you've probably seen your parents have this bottle on the beside the oven and beside the stove, and that's what they're using to help cook your food. Um, I guess. Canola is uh, gluten-free and it is um, also a Canadian product. It was modified right in Canada and canola means it is Canadian oil. And canola, when it's grown, the seed, it produces oil and it also has a meal content to it. So the oil wow. is out of the canola seed and then the remaining meal is used as a high protein food source for other animals. And typically it's used for dairy cows. And on that note, so when it, it is used in dairy cows, and thank you for sharing that Wayne. So uh, when it's worked into their feed, so it can increase milk production for a dairy cow by one liter of milk per cow per day, which is pretty crazy as well. Excellent, we'll carry along. So, and as Wayne has, so Wayne has already started to chat, but this is Wayne Schneider. He's one of our directors with Alberta Canola. And I'm going to let Wayne tell a little bit about his canola story and we'll kind of get started with that. So uh, Wayne, can you tell us where you're from please? And that sort of thing. Sure, I live at Nisku, Alberta, which is right between the Edmonton city limits and the international airport, right near Edmonton. Excellent. And Wayne, how long have you been involved with Alberta Canola for and what has kind of been your role or why did you want to get involved? I've been a director with Alberta Canola for three years. Uh, I wanted to get involved with Alberta Canola because myself as a farmer, I wanted to be involved with what was going on in, in, in the industry so that I'd have a voice with, along with other farmers, the way that we want to have um, the canola industry growing forward. We wanted the canola industry to thrive and to help farmers be profitable and to have a positive impact on the industry. Great, well, thank you so much. And so, Wayne, can you maybe talk, talk to us about uh, what your farm name is and what type of farm do you have? And what do you grow? Yes, I, uh, my farm is called Great West Farms. And on my farm, we grow canola, we grow barley, we grow wheat, and we also grow yellow peas. So the wheat that we grow on our farm, it goes to make bread that you'd see in the bakery that you'd take home to make your sandwiches. Uh, the malt barley would be used either to help feed cattle or it would also go to make beer. 
the yellow peas is also a feed source for animals and it is also used to make soups and other products. Wonderful. And Wayne, you have a you have a young family. Can you tell us a little bit about um, your, I believe you have a son and a daughter? Yes, I have a son, Ethan, that's eight, and my daughter, Liesl, is six. Uh, I also farm along with my wife and with my parents. Excellent. Very cool. And do you have any animals or livestock on your farm, Wayne? We have a few chickens that we raise for eggs right now. And in the spring, we typically get um, chickens that we grow for their meat so that we can have chicken and chicken breasts and drumsticks and... Wonderful. And, and we also have one cat and to one keep cat. them mice away. Excellent. Well, thank you, Wayne. And so Wayne, I guess our next big question is, why, why do you choose to farm and what got you kind of into farming and why grow canola? I guess what got me into farming was uh, through my parents and through my grandparents and actually through my great grandparents. Uh, the farm that I live on is, uh, I'm fourth generation and my great grandparents started farming the field that I live at over, well, back in 1904. So that was actually before Alberta was even a province. Uh, so since then, farming has been in our family. And I've actually only grown up knowing about farming. And I enjoy it. I want to help feed the world. And canola is one of our uh, main crops. It's our one cash crop that we grow to help pay for our, all our bills and for everything that we do to make a living, to help buy food to put on our table and for our house that we live in. Great. We Excellent. grow uh, canola as a rotation with uh, all of our other crops that help reduce the amount of disease and helps keep the soil healthy. Excellent. Thank you. So our next question I get, Wayne, is uh, so you, you said you had started at a pr pretty young age, if I'm correct. Is, is that right? Helping on the family farm with your parents, your grandparents? Yes. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, my dad would always be out on the farm and I'd always want to be out there to help him any way that I could, whether I was sitting in the truck, driving, uh, riding to town to deliver the canola, or if I was out in the field, um, being in the tractor or watching what he's doing from afar. Excellent. And how about your son and daughter? Do they want to be canola farmers maybe, or do they have interest in farming with you right now? Yeah, they love to be out wherever I am. Um, they like to be riding the tractor and in the combine and in the trucks. Um, I know it's, um, yeah, they, they just want to be out there wherever I am. Wonderful. Thank you. And Wayne, I know we've talked a little bit about this before, but I, 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 you always weren't, sort, let me rephrase that, pardon me. So you had another job or you almost took enough, uh, you had some other work experience before when you were younger. What was that job again, please? Yeah, when I um, graduated from high school, I decided to become a heavy duty mechanic. So first I started working on John Deere equipment all the farm equipment that's on our yard. And then I also decided to get a little bit more experience. So I started working on um, construction equipment. So that kind of took a change. And then when I got into that role, I also started working on the tower cranes. So the tower cranes are the big cranes that are used to build high rises and other buildings in big centers. Very cool. And Wayne, did that help you in your farming role as a farmer today? Did some of those skills help you out? Yes. So as a farmer, I am uh, constantly fixing equipment. We're constantly repairing breakdowns. We're manufacturing 
equipment and also tools to make our lives easier and to make it more efficient for what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Excellent, very cool. Well, thank you. And Wayne, so the next big question is, how big is your farm, Wayne? So our farm is about 1,700 acres. Okay. And I'm just trying to look at here what's all written on the screen because it's a little bit. Yeah, no, that's okay. So I can help you out with that. So for I know when I have taught students before and they've gone, miss, 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 how big is an acre? And we would always talk about football fields. So a one football field, for your reference, the standard football field is about 360 feet or 110 meters long or by 160 feet or 48.9 meters wide. So, and it, with each football playing field, so it's about 91.4 meters long and the end zones are about 9.14 meters deep. So the whole area of that football field would be roughly about 17,556 meters squared. And an area of one acre is roughly about 13,277 meters squared or about 1.3 football field. So when we do the math, Wayne's farm therefore would be approximately, Wayne, <laughs> how many football fields? 287 football fields. Exactly. So that's a pretty, that's a lot of football fields if you think about it. And now Wayne, just out of curiosity, can you explain uh, what this picture is about and what, what the importance of this is? So this picture is the machine that we use to seed our canola. So the tractor in front is what pulls the implement. The piece in the middle there that you see that's really wide, that is the tool that actually moves the soil with the shanks to put the canola down into the soil. It's covered back up with soil. And then there's all those little wheels at the very back. That's what packs the soil back down to keep the soil nice and secure um, to have good contact with the soil. Excellent. And then to the left, you see kind of a yellow, it's a yellow tank. And that tank would contain the seed, the canola seed. That's where you put the canola seed in. And then it has the hoses that actually blow it from the tank into the drill that puts it into the ground. And in that tank, we also have three more tank or two more tanks that have our other fertilizer that help grow that gives it the nutrients to be a strong and healthy plant. Excellent. Thanks, Wayne. So, Wayne, uh, you're a fourth gen generation Canadian farmer, am I correct? Yes, I am. Okay. And where where is your family uh, where's your family heritage from? I just out of curiosity. Well, we're originally from Europe. So it's kind of strange because we're a German descent with a uh, last name Schneider, but it showed that we were living in Poland under Russian rule when my great grandfather came over. Very cool. And is this your dad then, Wayne, here in the picture? Yes, it is. That's my dad, my son, and myself. Lovely. That's terrific. The other little picture is my son carrying the feed to feed the chickens. <laughs> it, looks, it looks pretty heavy for him. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we'll carry along. And our, I don't know, um, Helena or Larry, are there any questions so far that we may need to answer? Yeah, Helena, are there a few there? Um, yeah, from the beginning, we're wondering what is a cash crop? I know you used that term, but that's... A cash crop is a crop that I would typically not use on my farm to feed animals or... Um, use it as a any other source. Um, so I would haul my product to an elevator to sell it directly. And then the elevator would send it to the final processors or whoever is going to be using it at that point. Whereas like barley or wheat, it could be used as feed on my farm to feed chickens or 
cows or hogs. Okay. Um, and then also you were talking about like how many football fields of land you have, and that's a big area. Um, so we were wondering how long would it take to seed such a big area? Typically it takes about um, kind of a three week window. Mm. Um, when we're seeding, uh, my drill it's 60 feet wide and we're traveling along at about five miles an hour. So it's kind of the speed of a fast walk to a light jog sort of thing. And every trip we go up and down the field, it's about three acres. Okay, yeah, it's not a fast process because those machines are big and heavy, right? Yeah, they're big and heavy and you want to, it takes time for the seed to move from the tank through to the drill and into the ground. And if you're going too fast, then it just kind of sprays out on top of the ground and then you would not get, your canola would not grow. Right. And we have a question from Miss Cummings class. They ask, how long is a growing season from planting to harvest? So it's typically right around 100 days. So we seed our canola usually in May. So right around the May long weekend is ideal for seeding canola. And then by the time it is September, that will be kind of your 100 days, that's when we typically are starting to swath it or that's when the canola starts to dry, dry down so it's ripe. And we typically harvest it in end of September to beginning of October. Okay, well, that's all the questions we have in the chat right now. Oh, no, it looks like there's another one. Oh yeah, how long does it take to grow canola? So you just covered that. Um, takes quite a while. <laughs> uh, thank you, Wayne. Um, everybody, yeah, feel free to keep asking questions as we go along, and we'll uh, take breaks to get to them. I have. A, I just have a question, if I if I can, just based on the conversation we had the other day with pulses, and they when they seed, and so Wayne, you're seeding in a, a, around May, but at the beginning of the presentation there, we talked about the temperature. So how do you take the temperature of the soil? So you take a thermometer. So typically in the past, we've had just a probe that we've stuck into the soil to see what the temperature is. And lately we've kind of upgraded to um, one of those thermosters, the same sensor, kind of like what we were taking our sensors on our forehead with COVID. We would clear the top of the soil and we would shoot the little laser into the soil to see what the temperature of the soil was. And uh, the warmer the soil, the better. So it definitely can't be in the freezing mark or otherwise the canola will not germinate. So if it's kind of right around that eight degrees Celsius, that's when we typically like to start seeding canola. Hmm. Thank you. And we do have one more question that just popped up in the chat before we'll move on with the presentation. Uh, Miss Jackson, or sorry, Jackson wonders, how many machines, combines, swathers, tractors, et cetera, do you think you have on your farm? How many do I have? I don't know. I, we probably have, well, we have two large tractors, and then we have a few like loader tractors that we use, and then we have a caterpillar, and then all our lawnmowers and garden equipment. Uh, then our sprayer and combine, uh, all our drills, cultivators, um, our grain trucks and trailer for spraying. Um, we have lots of equipment that we use only kind of very once or twice a year, maybe for a month at a time. And then it sits for the rest of the year. Uh, so I don't know how to answer your question. We probably have about 20 to 30 different pieces of equipment. That makes sense. It's a big operation and you need the proper tools to do it. All right, well, I'll let you guys get back to the presentation, but feel free to keep dropping questions in the chat as we go. Thank you. So Wayne, we were, so the next question and whatnot we had for you. So uh, Wayne, you kind of told us a little bit, but can you tell some fun facts about yourself and your farm? Some fun facts about me. I guess we, uh, we raise chickens on our farm. We, get the chickens typically in April 
and uh, the ones I mentioned that we raised for meat, um, it only takes eight to 10 weeks to grow a chicken to where we raise it for enough meat. Uh, and then the chickens that we raise for eggs, they, we typically get them at the same time in April and they start laying eggs in around September to October. Um, my yard, like that's, I live right at my yard. Uh, I basically walk right outside my back door so I can walk right into my farmyard. And that's where we have store our equipment. That's, and we repair all of our equipment. I have a shop that we have our tools in. So um, like we talked earlier, I was a heavy duty mechanic. So we do a lot of equipment repairs on our farm and welding and electrical. And that's also on our farm is where we store our grain. So when a, at harvest time, we bring all the grain back to my yard and store it in bins until we can deliver it to the elevators or to the farmers that require our grain. Okay. Thanks, Wayne. And so what so maybe you could talk a little bit, why do, because um, you've talked about yourself, how you worked off farm a, a little bit before, and, but, and maybe you can speak a little bit more, why do some farmers work off of the farm? Sure. Uh, yeah, as a, a farm, a farm is a, a very highly and costly venture of lots of inputs, you have lots of expenses. And to get into farming, um, you typically are working alongside with your parents or with alongside with somebody else that is already in the industry. So there's typically not enough work or not enough money or cash flow to be able to support all the farms, especially, for example, when I started to work on my farm, I also worked off the farm to get a paycheck. And as my dad started to get less uh, involved with the farm, I was starting to take on more responsibility. And then I got a little bit more of a paycheck from the farm, but you need, there's lots of people that are needed on the farm for a very limited time. It's very busy in springtime and it's very busy in fall. And that gives the other um, people that work on the farm a ability to have an off-farm job. And while we're on this topic, we have a great question from Ahmed and Mara. Uh, do you do it all by yourself with your family or do you have extra help? We typically have done everything as family. So I have a sister and brother-in-law that would come out and help. And I have some uncles that come out and help. But uh, just this last year, we did hire one young, um, one young laborer to come help us do a bunch of random things around the yard in which we got to teach him the way things go on the, on the yard and on the farm. And it was a good experience for him and for myself. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. All right, so thanks Wayne. And so maybe next, and we, I know we just started talking a little bit more about that before we're coming up to it. So. Um, back to seeding. So Wayne, um, so you, you had mentioned that you, you usually do soil testing, you said it's about eight degrees is, or around eight degrees is when you kind of like to begin seeding. Is that correct? Yes, that's what we kind of aim for. I know yeah. it's there on the screen, it shows about at least five. So that's kind of like where you're when it's at least five, that's when you're probably starting to decide to get into the field and yeah. looking at the weather that's coming up in the next couple of days, you know if that's where you're going to be moving into. Okay, and the soil, sorry, the canola seed, when you go to seed, how far is it usually spaced out from the seeder when it's put into the ground? So yeah, it's typically the one to two centimeters. What we like to do is we like to have the very top of the soil nice and dry like dust, and then right below the soil, if there's some moisture that we can put the seed into is ideal. We don't want to try to seed canola into mud or any other crop into mud because then it does not grow. Excellent. 
And so how do you help the canola plant become big and strong? What do you have to put down with the canola? So we apply fertilizer. Uh, what we use, we use urea, uh, potash, phosphorus, and sulfur. And uh, we even add a little bit of boron as a different element to help the canola plant grow strong and healthy. Uh, and each one of those nutrients that you learn about, uh, urea is your nitrogen, uh, phosphorus is your P, K is potassium, and S is your sulfur. You're looking at the elemental table. Perfect. Okay. And on that note, we have a little bit, because it's pretty important, you know, when, when you're seeding, when to apply um, fertilizer and that kind of thing, right, Wayne? You have to do it at a certain time and at a certain rate and that sort of thing, correct? Yes, that's right. You can't just, yeah, you have to know what you're doing. You only get one chance every spring to do it properly. So we want to have the right source of a product. Yeah. So when you have the, the fertilizer blends. We actually get um, our agronomist to soil test our soil and they put take that to a lab and they actually measure to see how much of the different um, nutrients we have in the soil so that we know what to actually add um, to help grow the canola plant properly. So then we also have it at the right place. So we're using our air drill to get it to the right depth and we have our fertilizers to the side so that it doesn't contact the seed directly. Uh, the right timing, like I said, in spring, we need to have the right um, time of year to seed and the right temperature, and then at the right rate. We don't want to under apply any of our seed or fertilizer because then we won't get enough of a crop and we can't apply too much because it's too costly. And if you add too much, too much of a good thing is not good either. Excellent. Okay, well, thanks, Wayne. And we have a little bit of a video here to show you guys as well to go along with that quickly if we have time. Are we doing okay for time, Larry and Helena? Sorry? Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Hopefully you were able to see that okay. And we'll continue on with our with our chat. So, so Wayne, everybody's probably dying to know what is your favorite snacks and food you like to make with canola byproducts and and or canola oil? Yeah, well, one of the most common things that I personally use my canola oil for is when I fry my eggs. I always add a little bit of canola oil into the bottom of the pan and I crack my farm fresh eggs right into there. And um, yeah, it helps me cook it and it doesn't take on any other flavor. Um, and everybody knows about French fries. I'm sure all the kids in all the classes right now are yelling. That's their favorite thing when they get it at McDonald's or a w or any other fast food restaurant. They cook the french fries and your chicken nuggets and chicken strips in canola oil. That's right. Excellent. And your wife, she likes to make a lot of, uh, if you, you were talking to me about this one day. Is, I believe she likes to do a lot of baking with canola oil. Am I correct? Yeah, my wife likes to bake. And that's definitely one of the ingredients that we use. We use canola oil to make cookies and, and even like when we're making our stir fries for supper, we use canola oil in our pan and walks. Excellent. Thanks, Wayne. So we'll keep going along here. So Wayne, so what does environmental stewardship mean to you? Can I ask that question? Sure. As a farmer, uh, the environment is very important to us. We want to keep uh, our soil, our water, and 
the surrounding environment sustainable. So we do not want to have any um, soil erosion where it washes our soil and nutrients away. We don't want to contaminate any of our water source um, because that's what we use for our drinking water and to feed our cattle and for all of our animals. And even the, just the surrounding areas, like we have lots of trees and bush that well, a lot of the wildlife live in. So whether it's deer and moose and a lot of the ducks and birds, those are the things that uh, we see on a regular basis. And that's what we are trying to protect. Excellent. A great answer, Wayne. Um, Helena, do any of the kids have any questions right now? Uh, Ali wonders how many seeds you sow every year. Um, with canola, since canola is a very small seed, we would probably seed as much canola as I don't even know how to come what how big that would be. You do you have any canola seeds with you? Yeah. I have a small little uh, test tube of some canola seeds. And even in that, know. there's probably like thousands of seeds in there, right? Yes. So imagine how many of those tiny little seeds would take. It's pretty hard to do that math, right? So, and if it helps too, hopefully, this is a little bit of a bigger jar. But the seeds are super, super tiny, as you can see here, right? And I don't know if Wayne's even here, this is closer. So they're really, really tiny, like millimeters almost in size. So when we are seeding our canola, we seed it typically by weight. And the weight of canola, we seed five pounds of canola per acre. So that's a very, very small amount of canola and we have to spread it out evenly across the whole field or across the whole acre. Uh, and someone else asks how you get the oil out of the seeds. At, at the crushing plant, they, it goes through uh, basically a big corkscrew and it squeezes the oil, the canola seed, almost like as if you're squeezing uh, orange juice. So when you're squeezing orange juice, the juice comes out the bottom and you're left with all the orange peel. And that's what the oil is separated into and the meal is the remaining part. Okay. Um, and then someone wonders if your farm makes a lot of money, but we can dovetail off of that and ask, where do you sell all your crops to? Because you have a lot going on. So do you, do you have your own canola crushing plants or like, do you just deliver it there? What's kind of, what happens after you harvest? So our canola goes either to two different places. It will go to a local um, oil crusher that we have near Camrose and we haul it there and that's where they crush it to make oil and it's separated to meal. And at that point, that's when it's put into oil tankers and shipped to the final processors to whether they put it into bottling oil or whether they're using it for other uses. The canola meal would then be put onto a train and typically all that canola meal is actually shipped down to California to feed the dairy cows. Or our other option is for to be hauled to the local elevator, which we have at Edmonton. It would then be put onto a train, which is shipped to typically the Vancouver port or another port in BC. And it gets put onto a boat and it gets shipped to another country. And that's where they would do their own oil crushing and using the meal. That's interesting. So the canola we grow in Alberta ends up all over the world. Yes. Yeah. It gets shipped to Japan, China. Awesome. Well, that's all our questions for now. Uh, thank you so much, Wayne. Great. So Wayne, can you maybe talk to us a little bit more about uh, what do you try to do to be a sustainable farmer and, and making sure you're being environmentally friendly if you want to put it that way? Uh, first thing, like on the list, it says uh, crop rotation. If we're rotating between crops, 
between uh, like barley, wheat, canola, and peas, uh, we're rotating the different types of plants that we're growing in that field. So if we're rotating the different plants, then we'll be able to reduce the amount of diseases that are moving through the field. So um, to protect the crops and also the soil. Awesome. And then, uh, yeah. So then being sustainable is applying the right amount of fertilizer at the right time, at the right place and the right amount. Um, like I said, we get our soil tested so that we're not just guessing of what we're putting in. We're actually getting the experience and the amount of the proper amount of fertilizer to make our crop grow efficiently. Right. We're reducing the amount of tillage than that what we have done in the past. Uh, years ago, like you've seen in the pictures where they'd use a horse and they'd plow the soil and it would be all exposed. Now we're keeping more of the stubble or the existing plant that was in the field and we're just taking off the amount that we need to take off. Okay. And then Great. also find the right amount of herbicide at the right amount of time. Um, to reduce the amount of weeds that are in the field, it gives us amount of our, uh, it helps protect our investment so that we can grow the right amount of, or have a larger yield to, so we farm efficiently instead of dealing with weeds all the time. Right, and does the herbicide hurt the canola weight? No, it does not. Um, typical, um, how do I word that? There's herbicides that we use on the different types of canola plants and uh, the canola plant is resistant in two different herbicides. Okay, great. Well, thank you. And Wayne, did you, sorry, before I carry on, did you have anything else that you use to be a sustainable farmer? Do you use any technology on your farm? Oh yeah, we use lots of technology in our combines and in our tractors. Uh, we have computers going basically the whole time. Um, and the computers are actually driving our combines and tractors in a straight line. It's uh, receiving data from at ev every moment that we're moving across the field for what we're putting down into the ground with our seed and fertilizer. And it's also registering how much we're putting down a, for fertilizer. And also when we're harvesting, uh, it's taking all that data and it's making yield maps that show exactly what we're putting down and what we're taking off of the field. Awesome. That's pretty cool. Did your, did your, uh, when did the GPS kind of come into, did your dad have GPS too, Wayne? Or was that kind of more when you started farming? When did that happen? Uh, they, my dad and uncles, they kind of got the GPS just before I started. So GPS kind of started coming into play about 30 years, years but it was very expensive and not many people had it. And about 20 years ago is when we started investing in that um, technology. And since then, we really don't drive any equipment across the field without using the GPS technology. Gotcha. Very cool. Great. And just checking in again before we go on, um, Helena, are there any questions right now? No, we're good, Tara. Okay, excellent. Well, Wayne, is there anything else you would like to add before maybe we jump over to our knowledge challenge? No, I just want to say thanks to all the students and teachers that attended today, and hopefully I answered questions. And if you have more questions, you can definitely contact us at Alberta Canola. That's right. And Wayne, is uh, thank you, Wayne, for helping us out to do this today and taking the time to talk to us about your canola story. And, uh, we should, and Wayne can certainly answer some more questions and we'll be available for a little bit. But if it's okay with you all, I'd like to share a little bit of a game that I've created or just to see um, what your knowledge is about canola. So here we go. So we've got true, or, and if you want, you can put it into the chat box, whatnot, if you feel free. But true or false, canola is a Canadian invention.
Wayne, what be the answer? It's true. Excellent. Wayne knows his canola very well. All right. So, and canola was first bred through conventional traditional plant breeding methods in Canada. In other words, it's kind of like when you start growing tomato plants, if you think about it that way. And every year, if you want to grow a bigger tomato plant, you would try to keep the seeds back from the biggest and the best tomato plant in the garden. That was the same thing that how canola comes, came to be from a uh, traditional rapeseed plant. All right. So our next question, what is vegetable oil? And are all vegetable oils the same? So your options are all vegetable oils are made the same and produced from the same vegetables are all and or are all vegetable oils are not the same. You should always check the ingredient list. Wayne, what would be your answer? B. Excellent, that's correct. So if you refer to your ingredient list on the back of your oil, you probably can't really see this well right now, you'll notice that the, the different types of ingredients used to make the oil. So always read um, and check your ingredient labels for what you're using. Okay, and this just shows it again a little bit more clearly. So is canola oil gluten-free? So your two options are yes, it is clean before processing and tested for gluten proteins after it's refined and processed, and it's tested for gluten proteins after it's further refined. And no, if canola is thrown on a wheat field, it is impossible to clean before processing. I know that's a little bit of a mouthful. So do you think canola oil is or is not gluten-free? Yes or no? And Wayne? Yes, it is gluten-free. That's right. Because they do do a lot of testing at the crushing plant that Wayne was talking about to make sure that there is no gluten proteins um, and protein is, is, is a nutrient, right? If you think about it, um, and that's not being protected in canola oil along the journey. Okay, so it was just our answer again here. And how deep did Wayne say canola seeds should be planted in the soil? Option A, one to two centimeters. Option B, two to five centimeters. Option C, five to 10 centimeters. Or option D, two to 15 centimeters. Tricky question, I know. Wayne, what's our answer? I saw that Ella was all over that answer with A, one to two centimeters. Excellent. Way to go, Ella. And that's absolutely correct, one to two centimeters. So our next question is, canola hat oil has a shelf life, and meaning kind of how long it's good for, for about two months, one year, or six months, or no oil is so good, it never goes bad. Three thinking hard. You can see this. Wayne, what would your answer be? I'd say it's B, approximately one year. Let's see. That's absolutely right. You got her. Okay. Now, tricky question of the day. What generation of farmer is Wayne? First, second, fourth, or fifth generation? See who's listening. Wayne, what generation are you? Yeah, I'm fourth generation. Beautiful, thank you. All right, so I also thought, and while I had him here too, uh, to show you guys, and then we'll get to some questions. So, when canola is ready to be harvested, because of the flowers behind me in my picture here, even though they aren't quite real, but the flowers end up making these green kind of pod-like structures, and in the pods are what produces the seed. And in the fall, when uh, those pods become kind of more dried out and golden yellow, the seeds will become black, and the pods will kind of become this yellow-like in color and inside you'll see the black seeds. 
So thought I would share that with you quickly as well. When you're traveling around in fall time, may notice some canola fields, the bright yellow flowers, kind of uh, not being flowers, but having the pods on them instead. Now, are there any further questions for Hel uh, Helena or Larice or Wayne or I? There aren't any in the chat right now, but if anyone thinks of anything, feel free to ask it in the chat. And I'll also let teachers and kids know if you go, you can follow us on Facebook as well. Um, we're on Facebook and we're on Twitter. So learn about canola or learncanola.com. And as well, we, the teachers out there, we just uh, presented actually with Alberta Pulse Growers at Teachers Convention recently. And we uh, did a specific crops in the box with canola and Alberta pulses together. So if you can check back on your convention website, you'll get some additional information there to share with students and um, can reach us out, out to us that way as well. And we have a new uh, STEM-based STEM canola activity workbook. Um, and certainly feel free to check out our website, learncanola.com, to find out more additional information on that and how you can get a copy for your classroom to use. We've got lots of great games, activities, crafts, and all that sort of thing. It's a science experiment. A grades kindergarten to grade three. Awesome. Uh, and Ella in the chat says that this is a cool class. So not a question, but thank you guys so much because this has been awesome. She's got her, she's the canology. I'm loving that. We all have acquired some canology today. So now when we're out this summer driving around and we can tell our parents and our brothers and sisters and friends, we can share all our knowledge. So uh, we thank you guys Sarah and Wayne so much. That was fantastic. And we know now we're in March. So uh, Wayne's going to be getting pretty excited about getting all his, his uh, large equipment out to get out in the fields. And when it, when May comes, so let's think about the middle of May, we can all think that Wayne is going to be out in the field planting his canola seeds for us all so we can enjoy canola oil all year round. Thank you. Nice. So, Thank you. so that wraps up our session for today. Uh, we will be sending out a follow up um, survey just for our for our teachers and, and parents to provide um, some some feedback on as well. We've got some links that Tara's mentioned as well as Helena's posted some in the in the chat. There's such wonderful, really fun canola resources um, that you can download or order. So make sure you do that. And um, we enjoyed our time together and we thank you so much and have a beautiful day. Thank you.